Well, good afternoon and good morning. Uh, welcome to Parents Reconciling Networks um, Virtual Porch, the first one of our fall series. We are so happy um, to have you join us today. My name is Emily Bagwell. My pronouns are she and her, and I am joining you from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm on staff with Reconciling Ministries Network, and um, Parents Reconciling Network is one of our extension ministries, um, really as a support and a resource for for parents of LGBTQ plus people. And this group has done many wonderful things throughout the years, but during COVID and now beyond, um, we have continued to provide these opportunities of conversation and gathering because we believe in um, providing opportunities for learning and growing together, for asking questions and um, and just continuing to, to, to understand um, what it means and feels like to have support um, as you journey with um, your family member, with your child. Um, and so we are grateful to have this opportunity to gather in this virtual space. I'm very excited about today's conversation and, and the one who will help to host and lead us and guide us through the, through the topic today, which is advocacy and allyship. We are pleased to have Liz Dyer with Mama Bears leading and joining us today. Um, this is a topic that we will always be returning to because we can always do better and learn more and figure out ways to advocate for um, and be in allyship with the LGBTQ plus community. And so we are grateful for um, Liz being here and joining us today and being willing um, to, to lead us um, and tell us a little bit about Mama Bears her personal story and what um, their group has learned along the way and to share her wisdom and guidance for us as we continue uh, to to journey um, together on this on this allyship and advocacy um, path. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. Um, but before I do so, I want to remind you all that this is a, um, a conversation um, in the best sense yeah. that we can do uh -huh. virtually. Um, and that is an invitation for you to put any questions that you might have as Liz is speaking um, in the chat. Um, I will be monitoring the chat and looking at that. You can send it just um, so that everyone can see it. But if you have a question that you would like to ask more privately, um, you are welcome to do so by sending it directly to um, me in the chat so that I can see it. And I'm happy to bring that and raise that with the group. Just a couple of ground rules. We will ask if you'll keep yourself on mute while Liz is sharing um, her presentation and kind of leading wow. us. There will be a time of um, conversation um, towards the end with a Q&A that you're welcome again to um, put those questions in the chat or when it comes to that time um, of our gathering today um, to um, come off a of mute and to ask it. We'd love to hear your voice as well. For those who are joining us later online, we are always um, happy to hear from you. If you have questions that you'd like us to follow up with you on, you can always email us um, either at admin at rmnetwork.org or to me personally, emily at rmnetwork.org. So thank you so much for being here. Liz, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. We're so happy um, to welcome you to this virtual space. Um, and if you will, introduce yourself and lead us in today's conversation. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, <clears throat> thank you for having me today. I, I really appreciate the work that you guys do as a woman of faith and a mom uh, of, of a child who is a member of the LGBTQ community. Your ministry and your work is so important to me and to families like mine. So I really appreciate you all and, and thank you so much. Um, I want to talk to you today uh, about what I've learned over the years about being a good ally uh, for the LGBTQ community, but I thought before we got started on that, I would share a little bit of my own journey um, and how I came to start uh, the Mama Bears organization. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, there'll be a few um, visuals that will help me stay on track. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you can see that. Um, my um, son came out to me when uh, he was in his second year of college. He came out as gay and um, I can't say it was a total shock, but at the same time, 
I wasn't prepared. And unfortunately, at that time, I was not affirming. I had bought into the idea that, um, you know, living as a gay person was harmful and unhealthy and uh, not what God intended. And that being in a relationship with someone of the same gender, um, you know, in a sexual or romantic relationship with someone of the same gender was um, outside of God's will and, you know, would not lead to, you know, happiness and satisfaction. And, you know, as a loving parent, I just wanted uh, the best for my son and uh, I wanted to guide him in the right direction. And so even though I, you know, felt pretty confident in my position, I knew that I had a responsibility to, you know, kind of make sure that I knew what I was basing my beliefs on. I really thought I was going to be able to go to the Bible and find out that it supported my position because that was the position of the faith community that I was in. That was the position of pastors that I was connected to. And so um, I knew how to study the Bible well. I led women's ministry um, and I wrote and taught Bible studies. I spoke at women's events, uh, Christian women's events. And um, so when I went to the Bible, I wanted to be very thorough and look at all the verses that were used to um, warn against or condemn um, same gender relationships. And I was surprised. Um, I didn't find what I thought I would find there. When I really dug into those scriptures, it didn't take me long to realize that none of those scriptures that were traditionally used to warn against same gender relationships uh, applied to my son. My son wanted to date and fall in love and get married and have a family like most of us. He just didn't want to do it with someone of the opposite gender. Um, but that didn't really um, throw me off too badly because I knew that the Bible did not directly answer every question or, you know, every exact situation that we, <coughs> excuse me, that we find ourselves in. Excuse me, got a few allergies here. Texas weather, what can I tell you? Um, so I knew that, you know, we follow the principles of scripture, but often we have to look at real life and see, you know, how things are working out when a theology is actually being lived into and applied to people's lives. And so I started trying to make connections with, um, people who, you know, had different views about this. I wanted to listen to everybody. I started making connections with LGBTQ people. I started reading people's stories and books. And I was really surprised because my um, expectation was that I would meet people, LGBTQ people who were embracing non-affirming theology. And I thought that they would be more healthy, more whole, more well-adjusted, more satisfied than people that were, you know, accepting that they were gay and living into that uh, identity in a wholehearted way. And I found just the opposite. I found that LGBTQ people who were embracing non-affirming theology were having, um, you know, a lot more issues, uh, mental health issues, they were struggling spiritually, relationally. Uh, many of them were dealing with a lot of uh, self-hatred and self-loathing. There was self-harm in many instances and people were thinking about suicide or even having suicide attempts. Many of them were having physical ailments that they really couldn't you know, diagnose or, or figure out. They would you know, think they were having a heart attack or just you know, feeling sick and not knowing what it was, you know, what was causing it. And yet LGBTQ people that I was talking to who were embracing affirming theology, and especially if they were connected to um, a community or a group of people or had family and friends who were affirming them also, they were much more healthy and whole in every way, spiritually, relationally, emotionally, mentally. And this, you know, made me stop and think, um, 
because I had always believed that if you follow God's will, his way, that you would be more healthy and whole. Um, I certainly didn't believe it would solve every problem, but I didn't think it would make you worse. And so if theology is consistently producing, you know, bad fruit, then I felt like, you know, something must be awry. I have to rethink things because I honestly believed and I talked to women all the time that good theology produces good fruit in their life and that that was one way, you know, to discern about theology is the kind of fruit that it's actually producing in your life. Um, you know, I began to think about that we can all find a church, a group of people, a book, a pastor, friends who will support our position. And we can all find a Bible verse to support our position. But what we can't do is we cannot manipulate the fruit that theology produces in our life. That comes naturally, organically. I like to say the fruit doesn't lie. And so this is and was the beginning of me actually becoming affirming. On top of this, I also uh, began to realize that it would be unjust for me to condemn same gender relationships if I could not find evidence uh, that that should be done. You know, God says, don't call something unclean that I call clean. And uh, so I actually came to the conclusion that it would be a sin for me to condemn same gender relationships. And I, I like to tell this story because I think it's an important story for us as Christians because so many times we are told that we must have thrown out the Bible or abandoned our faith or, you know, just twisted things in order to get to a position that we wanted to get to. And I have to say, you know, as parents, of course, we're not just going to flippantly tell our kids something to make them feel better. We want the best for them. We want to guide them and direct them, you know, in the right way that will lead them to you know, a good, satisfying, productive, healthy, and whole life. We are, we're not just, you know, grabbing something out of the wind because it sounds good or because it will temporarily make uh, someone feel good. No, and that's why I think it's so important. And I like to emphasize that I became affirming because of my faith, not in spite of it. And I think that's a really important message uh, in the Christian community for us to be telling, because um, we we also don't want to, you know, lead people to believe that you have to choose between your faith and being affirming. We don't want parents to think I have to choose between my faith and loving and supporting my LGBTQ child. Those are not choices that we have to make. We can be committed followers of Jesus Christ and be affirming. In fact, I mean, I honestly believe that being a follower of Jesus Christ requires us to affirm and support and fully include and celebrate our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. So I wanted to share that with you today. So after I became affirming, and of course, you know, this takes time, especially my son came out 14, 15 years ago there, you know, everything took longer then because there was less support. There was less information. Uh, today, you know, there is a little bit of a faster process for many people, but, um, you know, this took time, but, but over the years, I, you know, I made a lot of connections and I started um, helping other families who had kids coming out to them helping them, uh, you know, with the resources and, and the knowledge that I had discovered and, um, you know, helping them understand they didn't have to choose between their faith and supporting and loving their kid. And so, um, you know, several years into the journey, um, I was no longer a, um, a reluctant uh, parent of a, a gay son. I was a proud mom and I let people know that and that furthered me making a lot of connections. And in 2014, I began to really think about the fact that my son was facing a lot of discrimination and oppression and marginalization, not just in the church, but also in the world as a whole. And um, I wanted to do something about it, but I knew I couldn't do much by myself. So I thought, well, you know, there's a lot of moms out there 
who think like me because I'm, I'm talking to them and they also want to, you know, change the world and make it a better place. So I started a, a, a Facebook group. I didn't really know what it would lead to, but it, I started it for moms of LGBTQ kids because I, you know, had a history of working with women and I felt like I was good at that. Um, you know, um, helping women connect and empowering women to live wholeheartedly into their potential. And um, so I wanted to start a group for moms of LGBTQ kids. I did have high hopes and big dreams. I hope that thousands of moms would join the group. And um, I dreamed that they would be inspired not only to wholeheartedly affirm and celebrate their own LGBTQ kids, which is really powerful in itself, but also inspired to work together to change the world and make it a kinder, safer, more loving place for all LGBTQ people to live. And I'm excited to say that what I hoped for has happened and my dreams are really coming true. I started that one Facebook group with about 150 moms of LGBTQ kids. I named it Serendipity Doodah, uh, which is a story in itself. Um, and today we have 35,000, more than 35,000 moms of LGBTQ kids in that one group. And that one group has grown into a whole organization known as Real Mama Bears. Today, we have more than 60 local chapters. And what I love about our local chapters is it makes it easier for our members to get together in person, sometimes just for fun, uh, sometimes to lean on each other and find support, and sometimes to do advocacy work. Uh, so those chapters are all over the United States and also in Australia, Canada, and the UK. We have eight additional private groups that we have uh, developed and we support. They serve families with LGBTQ members and the LGBTQ community. And I'm so proud to say that we have eight programs that serve the LGBTQ community. And this has become, um, you know, a, a, a real source of connection for mama bears to be able to spread their love and support outside of their own family to LGBTQ members who need support for a variety of reasons. I think most of what the mama bears do would fall in the category of small acts of kindness. They do things like stand in at weddings, they make hospital visits, they invite LGBTQ people to their homes during the holidays. They um, make handmade blankets and put together care packages and send those out to LGBTQ people to let them know that, you know, they're not alone, that they're being supported and celebrated just as they are. We've um, had a big growth spurt in the last few years. Um, some of that is, a lot of it is word of mouth, but some of it is also because we've been in the news quite a bit. We were included in a Radio Lab Unerased podcast that was used to promote the movie Boy Erased that starred uh, Nicole Kidman and Russell Crowe. And um, that really got us a lot of attention. Also in 2017, an award-winning documentarian contacted me and she wanted to share the story of the Mama Bears uh, with the world. She was really impressed with uh, moms, especially who came from conservative Christian backgrounds and became affirming and ended up being passionate advocates for the community. And so uh, that documentary was released earlier this year and it's uh, traveling around at film festivals. I think it's a beautiful um, story that she tells and she does it in such a wonderful way. It's, it's winning awards and getting rave reviews. You can go to mamabearsdoc.com Dot org if you want to see where the film is uh, showing. And some of the film festivals even have um, virtual screenings that you can buy tickets to. And then um, kind of a biggie that happened uh, for the Mama Bear community is we were included and featured in a Schitt's Creek finale documentary. This documentary showed after the final episode of the series and we had written a letter to the cast and crew, Dan uh, Levy and the cast and crew of Schitt's Creek to thank them for the way they represented LGBTQ people and their relationships. We often do this. We send letters um, with thousands of signatures to individuals or organizations, churches, other businesses, 
um, that we feel are working to make the world a kinder, safer, more loving place for LGBTQ people to live. And so we sent this letter and we got it to the right people and they fell in love with the letter that we sent and the idea of our community. And so they included it in the documentary. Um, I know many of you have seen it, but uh, some of you may not have. And I am going to share that little clip with you right now. You might want to grab a Kleenex. It still makes me cry and I wrote the letter. <laughs> Let's see here. This is a letter from a Facebook group called Serendipity Doodah. It's a group of moms with uh, LGBTQ kids and they have written you a letter oh. to thank you for everything that you've done for their kids and the community that you represent. <laughs> Why this whole... Oh my God. Okay, it's all the names. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh. Can you read the letter? You want me to read it? <laughs> Dear Mr. Dan Levy and cast, crew, and writers of Schitt's Creek, we belong to a large private Facebook group called Serendipity Doodah for Moms, home of the Mama Bears. We have more than 5,000 moms in the group, and many of us are working to make the world a kinder, safer, more loving place for all LGBTQ people to live. More than 1,800 of us are signing this letter because we wanted to say thank you for the LGBTQ characters, relationships, and storylines that you've included in Schitt's Creek. Your commitment to represent love and tolerance in your show is so important to families like ours. Your willingness to explore, inform, and educate about LGBTQ people and their relationships in an entertaining but respectful and positive manner sets a tone that is often missing. You have created new ways for queer viewers to see themselves represented, and in its own way, that is just as important as the battles we are still fighting. Therefore, the work you have all done on Schitt's Creek has encouraged us greatly and given us hope about the future for our kids. We sincerely believe that shows like Schitt's Creek will serve as a catalyst to help change the world into a kinder, safer, more loving place for all LGBTQ people to live, and because of that, we will remain forever grateful. You've made a lot of mama bears happy, and as a result, you have a whole bunch of fans forever. With sincere gratitude and respect. Wow. Uh, okay. Well, can I see that? I am very proud of the fact that this show sort of shines like a positive light out there into people's homes. But the fact that people are also experiencing something deeper through the show is you can't ask for anything better. It's wonderful. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is kind of emotional. Uh, let's see if we can get back to what we were doing here. So anyway, after that aired, um, our growth spurt just exploded. And um, we were excited about that because we really do believe that... Um, every connection we make with a family and empower them to wholeheartedly affirm and support and celebrate their own LGBTQ kids has a tremendous ripple effect. Um, we believe that as the family goes, so goes the world. And so the more families we connect with and empower, the more change that we see in the world. And, and we, we believe in the end that, you know, love will win. Um, in the mama bear community, I guess you would, I would say that the highest priority is supporting, protecting and advocating for, L, for the LGBTQ community, our kids and everyone outside of our family. And so because that's such a high priority, we put a lot of emphasis on what it means to be a good ally, <clears throat> a good advocate. And, um, you know, that's a learning process. And so we like to, remind ourselves of what makes a good ally and we like to also share that so I'm excited to share some of these things with you today many of them you know you'll say oh yeah I know that but still it's always good to review <clears throat> and to think about so the first thing I would say when it comes to tips for LGBTQ allyship is good allies are always learning um, you know knowledge is is the foundation of being a good ally and um 
also we need to really develop a, a true understanding of how the world views and treats members of the LGBTQ community. And we can do that by listening to stories, watching films, reading books, um, talking um, with other families who have LGBTQ members and with LGBTQ people. I do think it's important that we remember that it's not the responsibility of LGBTQ people or really anyone to educate us. We need to do our own work to become knowledgeable and educated and well-informed. But um, you know, when people are willing to share personal stories or personal experiences, that's probably one of the best um, learning uh, tools that we have available to us. Uh, number two, I would say that good allies are intentionally and thoughtfully inclusive. Now, of course, it's important that we include LGBTQ people in, you know, our social gatherings, um, our, you know, faith communities, um, you know, activities that we're involved in. But really, when I talk about um, intentionally and thoughtfully being inclusive, I really want us to dive in deeper and think about that to do this, we have to really evolve in the way that we think and behave. Because we've all grown up in a world that um, considers uh, heterosexuality and being cisgender as normative. We've all grown up in a very binary world. And um, so we have to really be intentional about uh, changing the way we think and talk and behave. And so that it means we've got to evolve in the way that we speak, um, you know, the way that we um, kind of categorize people or separate people sometimes um, and, and the environments that we, we create. And, um, you know, I think that really takes community and discussion for us to do that. So that's really important, though, that we put a lot of thought and intention into being inclusive. Number three, I would say good allies are visible. They show up, they speak up, they don't hide their pride. I like to say there is no such thing as a silent ally. Um, if we are an ally, it requires us uh, to be visible. It's our responsibility to be visible. One friend of mine says that if we are an ally, we that means we're standing close enough to the community that we're advocating for so that we're getting hit by the same rocks that are being thrown at them. Um, you know, being an ally is not for the faint hearted. It's hard. And it comes with, um, you know, some criticism, um, some attacks sometimes. And, you know, we have to be prepared for that. And just keep in mind that whatever us as allies are receiving, you know, LGBTQ people receive it in a, um, you know, more hurtful, <clears throat> destructive way because um, <clears throat> it really goes to their core being. So don't hide your pride, find ways to show it. There's lots of ways to show your pride. Um, some little things, some big things. <clears throat> but it's really important. Excuse me, I'm sorry about my voice. <clears throat> Number four, this leads us to this point. Good allies confront homophobia, transphobia, prejudice, and misinformation. This is really important. And like I said, being an ally is hard. It's, it's uncomfortable at times. And I think, you know, for a lot of us, confronting homophobia and transphobia and discrimination and misinformation is one of the toughest things about being a good ally. But what I like to do and what makes it a little bit easier for me is I try to take the approach that a lot of homophobia and transphobia and discrimination that's taken place is not intentional. I like to first give everybody the benefit of the doubt that their intention is good. And so I approach my confrontations from that position. And, you know, I say something like, I know you probably don't intend it to be, but what you're doing or what you're saying is actually based and rooted in homophobia. And then, you know, I help, I want to help them see how that statement or that action or that environment that they're creating is homophobic or transphobic. Now, not everybody is 
well-intentioned. And so you don't have to get too far into that conversation probably to know, but it is good to know that most people are going to be a little defensive at first, even if their intention is good. That's human nature. We don't want to be misunderstood. We don't want to be mischaracterized. Um, so sometimes these conversations are hard and sometimes they don't go well at first. But what we hope is that if we do this in a civil, informative way, that at the at, at least we plant some seeds. I mean, Listen, I had a um, experience recently where something I did, someone told me it was homophobic. And my first reaction was to be defensive, even though I've been in this conversation for years and I know that's really not where I should go. I felt misunderstood and mischaracterized. But what they said to me, even though they said it a little harshly at the time, did plant seeds. And I was able within a day or so to go back to that person and have a better conversation, let them know I understood what they said. And I did change something uh, significant. And, and I'm grateful for these times. I really am. Uh, they're hard sometimes. They're difficult. We're human. We're not always going to do it perfectly. But if our heart is in the right place and we let ourselves stay humble, uh, we can get to the right place. But really, it is important for good allies to prepare yourself to confront these things when you are, you know, faced with them and, and have a few things in your back pocket, you know, decide ahead of time, this is what I'm going to say, and this is how I'm going to say it, and this is how I'm going to handle it. Also, too, it's not always good to do it too much in a group. Um, because that can kind of get bad, but maybe if it is, it does happen in a group, you can say something simple like, um, I'm an affirming person and I have a child who's a member of the community. And, um, I know you don't intend it, but I find that statement, um, offensive. And if you want to talk about it later in more detail, I'd be glad to do that, but I don't want to make a big deal about it right here. I just wanted to let you know, and you can go on like that, come up with some things like that to help you be prepared. Um, I think good allies know that language matters. Um, we use um, the right pronouns, um, people's you know, right names, and, and we use terms appropriately. Um, this takes a lot of education because things are changing constantly. There's so many terms out there. Um, I don't like to use the phrase preferred pronouns. I just ask people, you know, what are your pronouns, not your preferred pronouns? That makes some trans people feel like they're choosing their gender instead of living into their true self. Um, and these are things you can learn over time. Um, you're going to make some mistakes. You know, that happens. But um, I think, you know, language is really important. I put out a um, published a book this year called uh, Mama Bear's Glossary of LGBTQ Terms. And um, you can find that on Amazon. You can Google that title. And um, it has more than 140 terms in it. It has a lot of um, suggestions for non-binary um, language. And it can be really helpful. Of course, you're not going to remember every single term as you look through it, but it does help you a lot. And then we have another book that's going to be coming out probably here within the next month, um, that can be really helpful. And it has some information on there about language. It's especially for parents who have LGBTQ kids in school. It's to help them to learn to advocate for their uh, LGBTQ students. But it also has a lot of good information about language. So uh, good allies know that language matters. And we put a lot of time and effort and intentionality into what we say and, and knowing the terms. Let me look at my time here. Uh, good allies know they will mess up. Like I said, we're not going to do all this perfectly. We're going to make mistakes. But when we do mess up, we need to take a breath, apologize, ask for guidance if that's appropriate, and then make the necessary corrections. Um, I know our first um, response usually to be corrected are criticized is really to defend ourselves. But I really encourage you to try to keep that under restraint. Because when we try to um, defend ourselves and explain ourselves, that 
typically comes across as being resistant to change, even if that's not in our heart, even if we are open to change. And, um, you know, maybe the most you can say, um, so you don't sound too defensive is, um, I'm so sorry that that's the impression I gave you. That's certainly not what I want to do. And, you know, I'm sorry that I did that. I love what you're telling me. I'm going to take it to heart because I always want to be learning and growing and, and I'm willing to, you know, make changes and corrections as I go along because, you know, this is a process for me. So good allies do, you know, admit when they make a mistake and, you know, they don't. And also too, if you apologize too much, I think it puts too much emphasis on yourself and then it, can lead to the other person feeling like they need to comfort you and assure you that they've forgiven you. So, you know, make it as quick and easy as possible here for them. Uh, take in what they're saying and um, mostly be quiet and listen and then make corrections. Good allies respect the privacy of individuals. Um, if we know someone's gay and, you know, then that's their story to tell. Um, and we need to respect that. Um, if someone asks us if someone is, you know, trans or, or gay or lesbian, um, probably the best response is, um, I'm not sure, but even if I was, I probably would just tell you, you know, have a conversation with that story to tell. Now, some people are completely out. They have no problem with it. You know, that's different. Um, my own son, he has no problem. He's totally out. He doesn't mind if I share that he's gay. He wants people to know it. It's a part of, it's an important part of his identity. So, um, but when some people, you know, are more private and some people are still in the process of coming out. And so we need to really be careful and respect the privacy of individuals. Good allies encourage their friends and family members to become LGBTQ allies. Can't do it if we're hiding our pride, but, um, I like to invite my friends and family members to events that are celebrating the LGBTQ community. I like to share uh, books and programs and videos and films that include, um, you know, LGBTQ people and their stories, you know, in a positive or important way. And, um, you know, one thing, there's a lot of LGBTQ holidays and celebrations throughout the year. And sometimes we can, you know, share something about that on our um, social media sites. And, and just the knowledge of what LGBTQ people have to face can um, really draw people in. I know I talk to people all the time who have no idea of the discrimination and oppression that LGBTQ people still face. A lot of people don't realize some LGBTQ people live in places where they can still be fired just for being a member of the community. Um, you know, they can have trouble getting housing or, or a job. So um, a lot of people aren't familiar with these things. So I think there's a lot of avenues where we can really encourage other people to come and, and join the fight because we need everybody that is, that is for LGBTQ people to get involved and, and to be for their inclusivity, their rights and their protections. Good allies remember that even the little things matter. Um, the words that we use, um, you know, wearing a rainbow bracelet, uh, putting a pride flag out, um, asking someone what their pronouns are, the little things really matter. You know, they add up a lot. When you are a person who has historically been a member of a community that is um, consistently marginalized and oppressed, you notice the little things. I have mama bears tell stories to me all the time about, you know, wearing a t-shirt with, you know, free mom hugs to the drugstore and ending up with somebody in tears um, in their arms, uh, wearing a rainbow bracelet or, you know, putting a pride, uh, a pride flag or a progressive flag out in their yard and kids stopping by and just saying, oh, I like your flag. These are hints that people are noticing the little things and the little things really do matter. We can make a big difference in the world by just doing a few little things. Do you know a business in your community that is supportive of LGBTQ community? Go and support them and let them know why you're there. 
uh, share their information with others. These little things really matter and add up. And then um, good ally support organizations and institutions that support the LGBTQ community. We're so fortunate, we're living in a time where there are so many great organizations and institutions that support the LGBTQ community, but it can still be a little confusing about, you know, who's credible, what kind of work they're doing, is this where I should, you know, lend my support, my money, my time, my volunteer efforts. Um, that's one reason I was so excited when earlier, um, when late last year, I got the opportunity to start um, a giving circle for people to share their funds in that would support um, nonprofits that um, work for and support the LGBTQ community. I uh, partnered with a nonprofit out of Austin, Texas called Legacy Collective. It's, if you know who Jen Hatmaker is, that's her foundation. And we created the Mama Bears Giving Circle, which is a community of monthly donors. And we award grants to nonprofits that work to make the world a safe and more inclusive place for all LGBTQ people to live. We're getting ready to give out our first round of grants this month. Um, they're going to the Trevor Project, Gender Spectrum, GLSEN, and the Tyler Clemente Foundation. These are all organizations that are doing really important work to um, support and advocate for LGBTQ. And each of our grants to them are gonna be 17,500. We're so proud of that. And then every six months we will give out an, um, you know, these grants to four nonprofits and our monthly donors get to help us choose the nonprofits. They get to nominate and vote on the nonprofits. But what's really great is Legacy Collective goes through a very thorough vetting process. So all of these nonprofits have to pass certain requirements in order to receive our grants. And uh, that's just really great because you know, that way we know that we're giving our, our money to nonprofits that are really doing the work and being responsible and credible with the money that we give them. And so, um, you know, I invite any, any of you to think about showing your pride by donating to the Mama Bears Giving Circle. Oh, and 10% of what goes to the Giving Circle does come back to my organization to support the work we're doing. And then um, the rest of it, um, well, there is a fee for the management of the of the giving circle, that's 5%, but then everything else goes back to these nonprofits that support the LGBTQ community. And that's all I got. Um, I didn't come in too late. Uh, I hope that's something that I said really helps you become, you know, a better ally and uh, encourages you as you're on your journey to um, support the LGBTQ community, because I really believe in the long run that as I said, the fam as the family goes, so goes the world. And I believe that love is the answer. I believe that love will win in the end. And um, as long as there are, you know, kids being thrown out of their homes, as long as the suicide rate is um, high among uh, LGBTQ people, and uh, as long as LGBTQ youth are facing so much bullying in their day-to-day uh, -day lives, love cannot rest. Um, love has to be working hard every day, all the time. And um, I just thank you all for being on that kind of journey. Thank you so much, Liz. What a beautiful, um, literally just the colors are, are wonderful in your presentation. Um, and it was so good to hear um, from you. Um, I uh, want to invite you now, um, if you have questions to go ahead and throw those in the chat. We don't have too terribly long, but certainly um, can take a few moments to um, have any questions pointed at Liz. I will say we've gotten a couple of questions about um, links to different things. So I, I put a couple of things in the chat as we went, but as a registered participant, you will get a follow-up email that will continue contain a uh, link to this recording so you can um, watch it again or share it with uh, friends or family as, as you um, want to. Um, and then some of the references that Liz has made, I'll make sure to get that information from her, um, including links to the documentaries that were shared, um, curiosities about um, the book that you um, mentioned and also that is coming out um, soon. So I'll connect with Liz and make sure to help make that 
that um, available to you. So just know that that is that will be coming back to you um, as you have been here with us today. So thank you for that. Um, I will say just on a, a personal note, as Liz and I were preparing and talking about this, I knew that there would just be a wealth of, of knowledge and, and tips. And so I'm so grateful for what Liz um, covered today. And I hope that one of the things that you hear and receive is that it's not a prescription of in order to do this tip, it looks like this, but really it's an invitation to know your own community, to know what the needs are, to know ways for you to take a step, um, because we're all at different places in our journey of advocacy and inclusion and allyship. So doing something that is a step for you is a wonderful and beautiful thing. And I love that Liz led with that um, uh, one of the first tips is to be learners, um, to continue to um, self-educate. Um, and you are doing that by being present today. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, but we all need to continue to, to learn um, so that we can be better um, allies along the way. One of the questions that um, um, I see in the chat that I wanted to raise is, um, can we get a list of organizations that support um, um, our purposes? And I, I, I see that as being a great question. That will probably take a little bit of a work uh, to do, but as you can hear from what Liz um, shared, that there are some very identifiable um, organizations, partners. Um, I'm so grateful that Liz and her willingness to come and be here um, is, is a partner in this work. Um, we had Sarah Cunningham uh, with Free Mom Hugs come uh, last May. Um, there is opportunities for us to support each other's work, to, to raise up um, organizations that are, are doing things to be a, a support um, and a partner to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I also, in the conversation with Liz, really loved and said, please, yes, share about the Giving Circle, because I think that's a very specific way that an organization like Mama Bears is able to really um, extend the work that organizations are able to do. Um, and again, that may seem like a bigger threshold for some of us, but there are small ways that we do that and just who we support, um, as, as she said, like local businesses, products, etc. And there's always a buzz around pride with people and or organizations and companies making that evident. Um, but, but paying attention to your local community on a regular basis um, and telling them why you want to support them is a very concrete thing that you can do. Um, I'm just looking through the chat um, and seeing if there's anything else that we might be able to um, share or address today. Um, great comments. One of the questions that we have is what resources are available for asexual teens and young adults? Liz, do you have any a direct response to that that you might want to guide that person to? Well, um, I mean, I'm not exactly sure what kind of resources um, you're looking for uh, for asexual teens and young adults, um, but I can't think of anything that is just especially targeted only towards asexuality, um, but more and more um asexual people are being included and recognized in the conversation and i think that's really important and one of the best things i think um that's going on in the uh, mama bears community online is that you know all of these um sexual orientations and gender identities are being discussed and um, recognized and supported and celebrated and respected. And so, um, you know, I can't think of anything particular. If you go to realmamabears.org, we do have a link there that has a list of all um, the resources. And most of these resources, this list of resources are things that are recommended by parents of LGBTQ kids. Uh, who are affirming and supportive. So uh, maybe you might find something there, but I can't think of anything that is just specifically for that. Thank you. Yes, we're always um, at Reconciling Ministries as, as well, trying to evaluate what resources are helpful to folks. Um, so if anybody else who is present today um, knows of something to offer, um, you're welcome to, to do so in the, the chat um, because there um, are so many different avenues. There's 
podcasts and YouTube videos and TED Talks and books and articles and, you know, guidebooks. So there's a lot of different ways in which people get information out. Um, but, but curating that is sometimes the more difficult um, task. So we, I think we're all um, trying to help make things available that seem to be helpful to people's journey and, and the topics that um, they are uh, most attentive to. Um, one of the things and goals of Parents Reconciling Network is to continue to um, lift up just the um, both importance and the the some of the distinctions that occur with different members of the LGBTQ plus community, um, particularly around some laws and bills that we have seen more recently um, that are um, problematic um, as far as the trans community specifically. Um, and so we have some uh, topics and um, uh, that we will be addressing this, this fall and as we continue in our conversations. Um, about ways that we can be strong advocates and allies uh, for the trans community specifically um, and beyond as well. So um, I appreciate um, just the, the willingness to, um, to help us to know what you are concerned with and what you uh, would like to learn more about. Um, and again, we would always love to, to hear from you to know um, how we can best come alongside and support and mobilize um, you and us together um, to do this good work of love and affirmation for, for all of God's people. Um, Liz, I really do appreciate you sharing um, yes, and Emily, your personal I story. Go ahead. Go ahead, Liz. Oh, I was just going to say that I really do appreciate that question because now I'm going to be uh, on a mission to come up with a list of good uh, resources um, for parents of AC, uh, asexual um, kids and offer also for people who identify that way. So I really appreciate that question. Uh, that's what's so important, I think, about these right. kind of conversations and gatherings is, um, you know, it can remind us. Uh, because, you know, asexuality and even uh, gender non-confirming and non-binary, these are all really new conversations uh, that we're all having. So it is a learning curve for us. And uh, most of the time there is a lot of information out there, but we just haven't tapped into it. So I'm really going to look into that. And um, I'm always adding resources to our comprehensive list. So I really appreciate that. Thank you for bringing that up. Agreed. I echo that. It's just, it, that's one of the benefits of being in community like this today is to uh, resource each other and to, to share the uh, needs and desires of um, our own journey. Um, you'll see in the chat a couple of people offering um, maybe uh, some new resources to some of you. Um, so you're welcome to check that out. Again, I will help to curate what I um, have seen in the chat today in a follow-up email so that you'll have um, a good list of some things to turn to. So um, don't hesitate. If you don't, if you're not able to capture it, um, it'll come back to you um, in, in shortly as, as I get this information together and make it um, available to you. So with that, uh, we will end today's conversation. Again, thank you so much for joining Parents Reconciling Network and uh, Reconciling Ministries Network um, in this conversation with Liz Dyer with Mama Bears. I hope that you'll go back and check out more of the information that um, that group makes available. If you're not connected on their Facebook group, become another member. Um, those numbers um, increasing will only be a continued sign of support and love to the queer and trans community. Thank you all for the, the work that you do um, in your personal lives to your friends and uh, for your children, and also by joining with us uh, here today as we uh, work together to create um, safe spaces, spaces of affirmation and celebration for, for all people. So go forth um, on your day, um, be blessed, and look for God's love. It is certainly shining and all around us. Take care and blessings, everybody.